Tonight on The Breakdown, Jeff and the team are joined by Leon McDonald as we get an exclusive look inside the Blues camp. Kane discusses what not to do as a front rower in the Six Nations and Glenn pulls out the law book off the back of a weekend dominated by red and yellow. Don't go anywhere. Kia ora, hello and welcome to the show. What a show we have in front of you tonight. Thanks for everyone that is joining us. Of course, Super Sport out of South Africa. We've got Radio Sport, we've got the Herald online as well. Rugby Pass across the world. And of course, all of our great fans at home. Thanks for joining us. Well, what a weekend it was. Plenty of drama across the game, across the globe. We can't wait to get into it. Your team tonight, my team, Kane Hames, Glenn Jackson's on the panel with us, and Sir John Kerwin. And we're talking these... Jacko, red and yellow cars, that's what we had this weekend. And I want to ask you, how many times did you have to brand us one of these? Uh, three times, I think. One of them was completely wrong, so I had to ring... Uh, that was a Highlanders Aaron, one. Aaron Major to say sorry. And yep. The other one, I sent two guys off fighting at the same time, and they carried on fighting over the uh, sideline. So that was my red cards, uh, and I stopped them from there on. Is it a sick feeling? I want a sick feeling when you, you know it's an incident, you know what, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to affect the game here, I'm going to have to go to my pocket. When you're a referee, to have to do that? A hundred percent. I mean, you know, you don't do it lightly because you know that people have come to pay, watch the game, you know it can affect the game, but, you know, at the end of the day, as a referee, you've just got to make that decision. And, you know, I think in the weekend, the, the red card was the right decision. It wouldn't have been easy for Mike to do it, but he had no choice, in my opinion. How important is the help that you get? Because we're all sitting there waiting and you're talking to the TMO. I mean, is that important, the information you get? It makes it a lot tougher, JK, in terms of having a TMO then talking. Like, if you see something like a punch or, or you're straight out and you've got the decision made, it's very easy. But then you start looking at the footage with some guy talking to you, then it's slowed down and then you've got, a, you've got so many things to weigh up whether, whether it's the right decision or not. So it is tougher when you've got someone else in your ear talking about it. It's a complicated game. We're going to go deep into this contest that was in Wellington, but so much to talk about from the weekend. Here's Super Rugby in 60 seconds. Brad Thorne returned to a familiar field, but it wasn't the happy homecoming the former Crusaders champion wanted for his Reds. They scored four tries to the Crusaders' three, but that wasn't enough. Beautiful ball away to Dunchy. Christie, back and field, Drummond, Fonga Muku, that is a sensational try. Richie Moanga's boot ensuring the Crusaders win. He's kicking like a dream. It was a landslide of points in the second half for the Chiefs against the Waratahs, with halfback Brad Webber shining in an overall classy team performance and the Chiefs inflicting a record loss on the Tars. Brad Webber, he has got a double. In Pretoria, the Highlanders and Bulls were hard to tell apart, but a change at half-time had the Bulls seen clearly as they scored five second-half tries and 33 unanswered points for their first win of the year. The New Zealand derby in Wellington promised much, but was a scrappy match as defence and mistakes dominated. It was until the Canes saw red that the Blues began to get on top. Now well, red card, down to 14 men. And had the red mist descended on some of the Hurricanes leaders? I understand. Take a breath. It got worse. Via Fafita, the next to go. Then Geordie Barrett botched an intercept, gifting the Blues a penalty try. And oh, that might be another yellow. Oh, penalty try. We have had it all tonight. And they're down to 12 men. And their first win against the Canes since 2014. Yes, a smiling Leon McDonald. We're going to talk to him in the middle part of the show, of course, about where the Blues are at. But, Kane, oh, plenty of drama in Wellington on the weekend. When you look at it, you look at the incidents that were, were played out. A, a tough contest between two teams desperate to win. But in your view, in terms of the decisions that were made, were they justified? Yes. Yes, I think so. I, I know that Tyrell Lomax... Uh, it's just one of those rough ones, but I guess as uh, over a couple of years we've accepted that the framework is, is acceptable. I, sometimes I think we've got caught in it, but let's talk about Geordie Barrett. I think that one definitely was. I know a lot of people are arguing that's not a knockdown. Knockdown, they think it's this. Uh, but if you hit the ball up and it goes 10 metres away from you, you didn't have a chance of regathering it. And if you accept it, everyone will do it and will argue. And you're a, and you're a referee that's a, a new referee who's seeing this. Um, Jacko, you've done this for years. You understand this game. A lot of them were clear-cut. I'm interested in the shoulder charge one as well. The fact that... Do, what changes when a player 
rather than attempting to make a tackle, enters into the contact, and that initial contact is straight out of shoulder charge. Look, I think, you know, we all know in terms of what's changed in the game is line speed. And, and I think teams are just coming so hard into the contact area that half the time you, you guys aren't getting their arms up in time. So it actually becomes a shoulder charge. So, you know, we talk about the offside line and, and the space in the game, how it's becoming less and less. And I think just, you know, trying to win that battle in terms of the contact zone sometimes creates these shoulder charges. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the problem is when you have two tacklers in. So a lot of the... The, the arm not coming up is because you've actually got a teammate who's tackling. You're coming in and you're leaving your hand behind because your mate's in there. So, But it's red card every day of the week. You need to be out there. What, what annoyed me about... And that's definitely a red card. Like, when you see that's definitely a red card. You see the second tackler and he just drops his hand out. So we know the rules. It's tackle technique. He's too high, Jacko, isn't he? And the player, he hasn't wrapped his arm. So you have to red card it. I think when you go back to the Barrett thing... It's definitely, definitely a penalty try, but I don't think we should yellow card for that. A penalty's enough, and I think the fans and all of us have paid enough to watch the, the game complete. For Fita, totally. No arms. The red card, totally. But I just think, penalty try, yes, but yellow card? You know, like, I think that's too harsh for the crime. Well, there are a lot of reckless contacts in the game that are uncontrollable, where bodies are moving. There are so many moving parts. I look at this, Kane, and, and that conversation that was had last year around the impact of a red card in the game. Had that incidental contact happened in the first five minutes, that potential to lose the contest, the 15-on-15, 15 15, which the fans want to see... Is that something that needs to be revisited again? People have put out there the fact that maybe the possibility, the red card, but then that player has 10 minutes off and he is then replaced. Do they need to look at it again and do you think there's a solution? Yeah, well, I, 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 the thing is that it's quite a hard one because player safety is so paramount at the moment. Uh, these are the classic dirty shoulder charges you've seen in the past in rugby league. No, they're all accidental. People are changing height uh, very late and you've just got someone tucking their shoulder just slightly and hitting. And then we talk about ruining the spectacle. The hard part, I think that New Zealand, not New Zealand rugby, sorry, world rugby, the spectacle they're trying to avoid is that spectacle of old players coming to them and saying, you've, our head is hurt. Uh, you should have done something about it. They will come back to the law and say, hey, we red-carded everyone for you. There's other things that are frustrating me a whole lot more than, like, we can discuss it, but at the end of the day, it was a strike to the head. So anything around the head, player safety, yellow Paramount, or red, we know that. get it. But some of the other things in our games that are ruined the spectrum, like the offside line, is as frustrating, right? So, I don't know, Jacko, I've always wondered... So for me, like, if you have a look at the offside line here, I think we've got a couple of shots... That is just blatant offside, right? So the line speed's fast enough as it is. We've got to keep the, the teams on side. So I've always... One of the things that frustrates me, so frustrates me about the game is NRL are trying stuff. Two referees. This year they're trying a, 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 a captain's request to look into something. But here, who is responsible for that? Is it the touch judge? Does he call in to you? Is there too much going on in your in your ears? I mean, is it too much to look at? Are you not hearing it? Or the touch, he's not throwing it in? What happens there? Because on, on Saturday night, I was really frustrated. Both sides, I know Leon's here, but both sides at times were creeping up. And that's ruining our game as well. Mm, no. Um, you know, it's a big one. And I know that uh, retired, probably why, the reason why it's too difficult. But um, I think that... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a coach's bugbear. Like, they, they want space in the game, um, and, and we have to be hard on it as referees. Now, it is a team, in terms of the referee team, it's their responsibility to look after it. Now, I'd say most of it would go on to the AR shoulders around doing it. Now, if they are accorded in, then the referee takes it. And, and our issue, I think, a lot of times is the ruck's moving. You've sort of set the offside line as AR, and then there'll be a late sort of clean-out, and the ruck would extend and then you're sort of 50-50 around where the ball came out because it's so quick. So you're right, it's a really difficult job and, and maybe something that has to be looked in how we can do it better. Yeah, it's interesting because the word that a lot of referees use is clear and obvious. And I was thinking about on the way over, when I, I know when I'm an, an assistant referee on the sideline, I almost have the attitude that they've got to be clear and obviously offside. Mm. I think we should change that and they should be clear and obviously 
onside, there should be a huge gap, you're right, JK, between the uh, ruck and the line, and that should start from there. Well, isn't this the one thing that Steve Hansen, his whole time as All Black coach, talked about, was the fact he talked about how complicated the game was, he talked about the offside line, I know the Super Rugby coaches have talked about that, but there's so many moving parts. We talk about the breakdown, and if we, re we look at what happened in Wellington, I, I guess there was a sense of frustration. I would say from both teams in, at one point, but in the end, is this because this game has become so physical? You talk about double tackles, about the, the race for the gain line, Jacko. As you're refereeing this, so many moving parts, so many collisions. How challenging is it for one person in the middle? Of you, and like I say, you're not there now. How challenging is, it, challenging is it for you to adjudicate everything that you're seeing in front of you? I don't think two referees will help it. That, that's one thing I, I want to say. I, I just um, It happened in South Africa. They trialled it and there was a penalty one way and the referee on the other side had a hand the other way. Right. You know, and then they said, well, let's go to the, the other TMO <laughs> the, the, and uh, see team. who's right in the Let's not go there then. Let's not so go there. I don't know if that's... A, what is going to be hard to fix is, is really difficult. But what I know with New Zealand teams especially versus up, up north probably is they want to live on quick ball. And, and the other team knows us, so they're doing everything to try and slow it down and create a mess. And, and you know, you're probably right. In the weekend, uh, the breakdown but, was was a bit of a mess. But the uh, challenge I have, JK, is I don't want Super Rugby to be played like test matches. I don't want that, that type of contest. Cause, because you get to that point, then all of a sudden, there is no space. We're getting to a contest where the ball isn't moving. There's no continuity, which we tend to get when our two teams come together. What's to stop Sanza? putting together and adapting the laws of the game to create a better spectacle. Not falling under world rugby, what's to stop us going down that path? Lack of courageous leadership. I think the referees at the moment need some courageous leadership. I think we need more courage as sans are to say, we want to do it this way. And for me, it's not the referee's fault. Like, they've got 18 instantaneous decisions to make at the ruck time, so make life easier for them. I mean, Steve Hansen said, let's throw out the rule book and start again. But at the end of the day, Sanzar need to have show some courage and the referees, I've always said this, Jacko, that the trouble is that if we're more transparent with the referees, then they become more human so they don't become the, the guy in the middle, it's his fault. You know, it's just like everyone makes mistakes. Like TJ and Dan Coles got frustrated the other night. Why were they frustrated? Irrelevant, they shouldn't get frustrated. But we can't blame the ref. It's actually the, the, the law that we need to say, OK, let's change that. And I'd say that though, Kane, though, also the players and the coaches become a part of that, don't they? The part of that understanding, yes, there is a determination to go out and win and compete, but at the same time, surely they want to be part of a spectacle? Is that the way yeah, you well, see I the game? I guess so, like, even with the tackles, there's 75% of the play, an opposition player you can tackle. Why don't we focus so hard and go in there? Uh, at ruck time, uh, you're exactly right. I don't know if the coaches are painting the best pictures for the players to go to. And you probably get an op you probably get the picture you saw on the weekend with the Hurricanes are clearly practised something, it wasn't going their way, and they got very frustrated about it. So players, coaches have a ton I of... I disagree, do Goldie. I, 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 I don't think we can... Rel because in the Northern Hemisphere, they do not care if it's a spectacle or not. England would not care if they won 10-9 and it was the most boring game in the world. Right? But, that's test but that's we rugby. do in Southern Hemisphere. We want to play a certain style of rugby. And that style of rugby up until now has, I believe, been the best in the world. But if we don't watch out, our laws are going to slow our game down, and we don't want that. Well, so and where Hansen are the laws did, being made? And Steve Hansen did talk about that, didn't he, Jacko, last year, the fact that the, the defence at the moment is certainly the part of the game that is dominating it. 100%. You know, and I think, his, as you talked about before, it was uh, the line speed, and then are they onside, offside? I don't know if the tackler release has been as strong as, as it was. We used to see a real clear release, so that lifted the height of the breakdown because he had to stand up. And maybe, you know, as a group, you know, we talked to Leon before, that as a group probably over the last sort of two, three years, maybe we have been a little bit slack on it. Coaches understand that, so they'll jump on it and then and teach their players that it's something a little bit different. So it's a, I think it's a... We don't, I don't think as referees and coaches we get down and sit down about the game enough and, and really nut out, OK, what's important for each of us to, to get a better game? And I'd say the players have to be part of that conversation as well. Well, it's not all about a Super Rugby. Bernadine Oliver-Kirby is with it. And, Bernie, there has been so much action across the rugby globe this past weekend. Yes, indeed. You could say more cards in a game of poker, couldn't you? And this weekend, no different for the men's final at the Vancouver Sevens. Uh, yellow cards blighted the final between New Zealand and Australia. Both sides copped them, but the Kiwis, they hung on, finishing with just six players to our style Aussie neighbours 
17-14 after trailing 5-14 at the break. It's New Zealand's third series title of the seventh season and they extend their buffer at the top of the World Series standing by 11 points. Well done, lads. Well, we know what the ref gave him, but his red card also landed him a three-week ban for Hurricanes prop Terrell Lomax. It was probably more careless than calculated, but his high hit on Stephen Perifeta earned him a three-week rest. Now, Coach Jason Holland said, uh, we're just not smart enough around the tackle technique. So no prizes for guessing what the Canes will be drilled at training this weekend. Well, who knew just what a handy tackler Joe Marler was? Pretty handy, it turns out. Very handy with the tackle of Alan Wynne-Jones. Have a little peek at this. If you haven't seen it, you might have seen the snaps, but here are the moving pictures. The England props tickle on the tackle has the rugby world and wider talking. Yeah, he might have thought he got away with it. Not sure he has. Not when there's that many cameras around. Uh, it sort of brought back memories of the infamous Vinnie Jones crotch grab on Paul Gascoigne over 30 years ago now. Uh, apparently, he tried to call out to the linesman, but he couldn't get words out. He said he could only squeal in a high-pitched voice. And a closer look, check out the veins in his neck. Here's uh, some reaction on social media to what went on. Uh, Will Carling, he was, he was very, very outspoken. He basically said um, it was not aggressive, didn't cause any pain at all. So jumping to these ludicrous assumptions that, you know, it's a total overreaction. It was a humorous wind up. Was it? Hmm. The reaction continues. Uh, legend, Wales legend, uh, Gareth Thomas, Alfie, he basically said, and he's an openly gay man, he said, it never happened in my day, and I'm upset, because I would never have retired. Funny, maybe to some. Uh, Ronan Agarra, he climbed in as well. He said, the game needs characters like this. Hmm, Marla, what has he said? He has used his grown-up words to describe it as... <laughs> Bollocks. Complete bollocks. Not sure everyone would completely agree with that. Thoughts? Who wants to go first on this one? Well, I'll go Any first. first -hand when I, when yeah, I first saw first -hand it, when I first saw it, I thought they've obviously roomed together with the lines or something because they're mates, because it's something that men that that I would do to a really good mate of mine, no intent, just you like a tap on the ass not. or whatever. It's like, it's just like something, it's like, there's no offence in there. You just stay over there, mate. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, it's no offence in there. You tell me when you haven't seen that in the changing room, any of you. <laughs> I've seen it, yeah. I've seen it tons. Seen it tons. Surely, that's the word that goes What I see is, like, this, this I don't think there was any offence intended. Um, and if we say, OK, Hold if on. he gets four weeks to 12 weeks for the law, then... You know, I just thought he was taking the mickey and I didn't see any offence. This is not the first time, though. This is not the first time he's done it, is it, Bernie? Absolutely well, not. A, and what would have happened if it was in a, a women's game? Is it acceptable then? Hold on, in any, hold on. in any other workplace. That's a bit unfair. Hold on. In, so. any, in any other workplace, I'm sorry, what would happen about Well, so then? what's your opinion then? What's that? Oh, keep your hands to yourself. It's a game of footy, a game of rugby union. So you think he should get four to, tw four no. to 22 weeks? I don't think he should No, get... you have to, because no, you can't no, no. say... No, he can get four to 22. No well, he has to, because that's the law, yeah, right? Yeah, and good. Good riddance oh, to him. Well, I just good think... riddance to him. Take us four weeks and go I'm and find undecided. something else to do. Yeah, right? it just... Or Jacko, I mean, if you'd seen it firsthand in the game, and Alan Wynne-Jones... Had to, we've got you under. We've got you here for a great reason because yeah, all of these situations you've been in the middle. But Ellen James, if he'd taken real offence to that, what would it have forced you to do? Well, first of all, I thought it was a bit like J.K. I thought he must have known him to do that, like you know. But, but he you doesn't. Alan, it, no, you see Ellen Jones' reaction, and and obviously after the game and during the game, if you if you've seen that, you've got to card him. So I mean, you know, but. <laughs> when do you see it? Like, well, we, hold on, we've got people out there punching people. Got, we want them to focus on playing rugby. How about he just does that, Kane? I mean, this isn't a prop thing, is it? No, it's definitely not a prop thing. Okay, it's more good an to outside know. back Better thing. Better not be a prop <laughs> thing. Definitely an outside back thing. Marla used to play there and he still obviously has the, the odd hangover from it. Um, I think Alan Wynne Jones uh, actually probably needs to come to the party here. He probably needs to grab his own balls, pick them up, and stick up for his mate here. I think so, because it's his mate that he's talking about, and there's a special relationship there. I definitely think there is. I don't think it's Alan that special. Alan could stop his mate from getting banned for I don't think it's that special. I don't think Wynne Jones was that happy. He was, didn't look that happy in the press conference, and um, I don't know if there's any place for it on the field. No, um, I don't some, think so Some either. have likened it to, to witnessing a sexual assault, and I know that's extreme, but if some people feel like that, 
it's uncomfortable viewing. Just, it's unnecessary. Unnecessary. Another good word. Great work, Jeff. Um, so, Marla, he's been cited. There you go. He's been cited, Glenn. Um, and now, basically, along with his teammates, Courtney Laws and Manu Tualangi, for separate incidents. All three, they're going to appear before a disciplinary hearing, hearing in Dublin. That's on Friday. Uh, and we wait and watch Eddie Jones watch. We always expect a colourful spray, don't we, from Eddie after most matches, but this time it was the officials that were in the firing line. Uh, here's what he said after England's match against Wales. Uh, quality opposition. At the end, we're 13 against 16. It's hard. Uh, 13 against 16, did you say? Yep. Who was the 16? You worked that out. Well, I just find it bizarre. You know, I usually don't comment, but I can't see how you can tackle a guy. So you might as well just say... If someone's tackled like that, you let him go. Because how else are you supposed to tackle him? Like this bit about where your arms are. What a load of rubbish. Like, man, he was trying to kill the tackle. That's the only thing he was trying to do. Absolute rubbish. So I'm sorry. I've broken my rule. Doesn't he always? So three at the judiciary, possibly another one to come that will become four? Well, declining in numbers, not growing, is Six Nations games. Three fixtures that have now been deferred due to the COVID-19 outbreak in Europe. And the word has come from right up high. The French government has ordered the rescheduling of the Ireland-France game in Paris. England's game against Italy and Rome, that's also postponed, as is the match between Italy and Ireland, which was put off last weekend. That's still to play. Uh, France taking the outbreak so seriously, any gathering of 1,000 people or more prohibited. After a two-week hiatus of rugby games being suspended due to the coronavirus, games in Japan's top league, they're now suspended due to a class a drug. New Zealander Joel Everson, who plays for the Hino Red Dolphins, was arrested for allegedly using cocaine. The Japanese top league issued a statement last night, and this is extreme to say the least. Not only do they sincerely apologise to their fans that the disappointment caused, they go on, look at the last par. As a result, we've betrayed our fans and society, and we must work diligently to restore that trust. Now, I cannot remember in the history of any sports league Sport being halted due to a scandal like that. Is it even a scandal? That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. What they've done instead of making the right decision around coronavirus, they've used this. There's no precedent for this. The last three players that were had up for drugs, the club pulled out of the competition. They didn't stop the competition. That is ridiculous. That is not... That is betraying your fans by doing that. Because why should one man like, stop the whole tournament. We want our fans to go to the game. That's, I reckon so it's that's a cover-up. That's a handy excuse I, I think it's, for the I think it's totally oh, This is the most, one of the most absurd things I've ever seen, I think, Jacko. I mean, when I read that today, I'm going... I, I, I can't imagine one person anywhere in the world being able to stop a competition. Yeah, no, he's obviously uh, had a fair bit of it, maybe, but um, I think, obviously, they, uh, they're also worried about bringing their, um, their company down. You know, it's always about the company and, and their company being dragged down, but, yeah, she's a, she's a shock. Uh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Leave it at After that. the break, we'll leave it at that, right there. After the break, we've got this man, Leon McDonald. He is live in studio. There he is. But so much more to talk about with him and about the Blues and their success. But first, let's have a look back at the offloads, the best offloads of Super Rugby in 2020 so far. Stevenson and Webber's on the inside. Oh, Absolutely brilliant. And Brad Webber, he has got a double. Welcome back to Breakdown. Well, this year has been the Blues' best start over six rounds to Super Rugby since 2011. What happened that year? 
Well, they went on to make the quarterfinals. So let's have a look at their season to date. Well, the thought of Bodie Barrett wearing blue will take some getting used to for a few, uh, mainly Hurricanes fans, I suspect. But the superstar back, the third highest point scorer of all time in Super Rugby, was at Blues training today. And he's close to a start with a team who's now getting wins on the board. Game one, let's have a look. Their season opener was a cracker against the Chiefs. Not a bad first round out at first outing. Uh, Rico Ioane running in two tries, but, but it was the returning Chiefs' first five, Aaron Cruden, who really, really stole the show. Well, despite a win against the Waratahs, the footy was never going to get any easier against the defending champs, even at home at Eden Park. A 25-8 to eight point loss to the Crusaders. Let's be honest, a few teams earn bragging rights over the Southern outfit. Round four, and the Blues hit the road for a South African safari. It was a history-making trip. They notched up their first two wins in South Africa back-to-back -back since 2008, beating the Bulls and the Inform Stormers. The 33-14 to 14 win against the Stormers, their biggest there in a decade. Well, back home and another flight, albeit a shorter one, to the capital. The Blues' defensive brilliance in the first half gave them a fighting chance. And with the Canes losing three to the referee's pocket, the Blues ended their run of 25 straight losses in away matches in New Zealand. So, the momentum well and truly with the Blues. But to prove that they're the real deal, they want to roll the Lions this weekend at home, then the Brumbies, also at Eden Park a week later, then they have the bye, and then it's batter up the Crusaders. But let's go back to Bodie in blue. When? April the 11th, we have it. Lock in your diaries, kitted up and ready to play for his new team, against his old one, and I suspect that will be gold. What do you reckon, Leon? It'll be good. <laughs> he's excited. <laughs> I can tell he's smiling. He's smiling, and I think, Leon, it's great to, Leon, it's great to have you on the show. The first thing I want to ask you, six games in, you think to yourself, you're four and two, would that be a successful start for this campaign for you? Yeah, definitely. Obviously, South Africa early on's a, a tricky trip, so, um, you know, Crusaders and Chiefs, so it was always going to be a tougher start and um, to get a win away against um, the, the, the Canes was obviously a big one for us as well. So uh, it's a good start, but pretty realistic around the season. We've still got to travel a lot. We've got a lot of local derbies away. Sorry, you know, we've got to go down to the Christchurch soon and got to go to Highlanders. And so there's still plenty of big, big games ahead. Mark Talia, who I think has been outstanding, beats defenders. He said uh, after the game the other night that our coaches are trusting us with our work off the field. So what would, could you tell our viewers what your expectation is that after they've finished training, they're driving away, what, what would you be expecting a player to do his work off the field? What does that look like? Oh, look, you, you, review, you review training, so our training clips will go up, they have a look at um, their roles inside our, our plays or moves, um, our structures, making sure that they're nailing their roles. Um, and they get together in little little groups, I suppose, and make sure that they're ticking it off and, and helping each other learn. So there's new players coming in. We have injury replacements. We've got younger guys. So uh, it's about helping each other be successful, really, JK. And I think they're doing a good job of that so far. Yeah, Leon, um, normally in the Mighty Ten Cup, it's a successful year if you don't win, but you get the Ramfurly Shield. So only one team can win it this year. So let's say it's not that. What would be a successful year for the Blues? Oh, look, just continuing growth. I think um, you know we're making um, some progress in certain areas, and um, you know one of the things that we we pinpointed at the end of the year was around consistency. And at the moment, we're you know we feel like we're playing a lot more consistent rugby. Um, we work really hard on our fitness, and I think that's starting to show. And especially a lot of our defence, I think we we're getting off the ground a lot a lot better and getting some some good width to our defence and coming forward. So that, all those little parts of our game that we're trying to build up. Um, but, you know, everyone wants to know results. Win and loss is sort of what we get judged on and, and um, you know, playoffs is a, is a big target for us this year. Well, let's talk about some of the things then inside the organisation because quite often that success is off the field. Have you noticed a significant difference in this group, say, to compared 12 months ago and where have those changes been made in your view? Um, look, there's, you're, always, you're always striving to be better and I think um, this group, you know, I've, I've only been here for a, a year and a bit, but... Um, from from my observations this year, you know, I think the leadership group's probably been one of the biggest shifts. I think they've really grabbed this team and, and made it their own. Um, and, you know, led by Paddy, who's been fantastic as our captain this year, and he's been well supported by, um, you know, pretty small groups, so only four in it. And um, I think if your leadership group are really proactive and, and, uh, and, and leading by example and having high standards, then, you know, that, that's a big part of, of getting the off-field culture right. Have you invested in that leadership? Have you done anything outside of rugby to 
to promote that, or is it just a maturity thing? Oh no, we have. Um, we, we, we we've got a, um, Josh Blackie, who's a um, who, who's a he's a he's a bit of an expert around leadership. He's been a bit of a foil for Paddy and the team to 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 um, to give them another you know an opinion and some support. And he's been great there, giving us some help. And um, you know, I think every week they're just striving to be better and and um, they're challenging themselves and they're putting themselves in front of the team a lot more than than probably they would be, feel comfortable doing. But they know it's important and, and they're doing it. There's a new CEO, Andrew Hall, has come on, on board, uh, coming over from the Waratahs, coming here. What have you noticed that he's managed to do behind the scenes? And, and what have you talked about to him in terms of trying to take this organisation forward? Oh, look, there's lots going on around um, the Blues at the moment. It's an exciting place to be. There's, there's been a bit of change, obviously. Um, a new board coming and, and a lot of uh, new energy. But also, you know, there's a good alignment between the board and, and the players and what they want to achieve. And, and the players are really keen to, to, to grow... Um, the region, I suppose, and, and be out there and be visible. They want to get out into the public. They want to really connect with the the, um, the supporters of, of the region, and, and that's North and then North Harbour. So, um, you know, there's good synergy there with, with Andrew and the board. They, they see that as important as well. So, um, you know, it's an exciting time. Um, we've got some good young players that are, that are new to the, the Blues team, and, and, you know, they're not scarred from the past, I suppose. Uh, you know, they want to create their own legacy, and it's a great opportunity for them. Yeah, JK, you'll be able to help answer this too. Off-field... And it's different in Auckland, isn't it? So you talk about how you grow your off-field. For the Highlanders, it's different because they're in a different place. Uh, for everyone else, it's different. In Auckland, it's completely different. How does being in Auckland change your off-field? Yeah, I, well, I keep, you would know. You, you've had uh, to yeah. make a big shift as much as anyone, right? I keep getting told how difficult it is. Auckland's a great place to live. There's just so many opportunities everywhere. You know, you've got beaches. We can go recover um, down that at Mission Bay. It is music to his ears. It is <laughs> music. And I actually totally agree greatest with you. I love city being in the world. Well. It's a great, it's a great <laughs> place to city live. In the world. Um, everyone keeps going on about you know the, the, the traffic, but if you if you don't travel in the busy times, you don't hit it. So it doesn't. It's not a big deal. But we come in early. We eat breakfast together. Um, we train all morning. We have lunch together, um, and then we head home relatively early. So um, to have two meals together as a team is probably as good as most teams. And, and a lot of people talk about the culture at the Highlanders or the Crusaders, and they spend time together. I think the the Blues team spend as much time as anyone, if not more. Akira came, comes out on um, Saturday night. You know, he's been under a lot of pressure. He's, he's one of those players that is visible, so he gets a lot of attention. But there seems to be a really good internal competition culture coming on. I mean, has that competition within the team really helped get the best out of players as well? Yeah, look, it does. I know Akira's uh, probably a little bit frustrated because he hasn't had the, the minutes he'd like, but, but um, he's driving really hard behind the scenes, he got his opportunity and now that's put pressure on Hoskins to keep pushing, you know, and Hoskins put pressure on Aki in the first place. So um, we've seen it with um, Tony Lamborn turning up and putting pressure on Blake and, and Dalton for that seven jersey. Um, Blake gets his opportunity and I thought he was brilliant in the week and his, his energy around the park, it was like he was 18 again. So, um, you know, it's probably what the Crusaders have had in spades is a lot of depth and, and, and that, that um, competition for positions and, and at the moment um, it's driving, driving performance. Getting a lot of attention right now because you're in a place, as Bernie said, that the Blues haven't been for a while. The fact that you're playing with confidence. How do you get that balance right? Because, you know, at the moment... You, you're not anywhere near where you want to be and, and you're not near the end of the season. How do you get the balance right of just, OK, let's keep it real and but don't lose your confidence because we're not talking ourselves up? How do you get that right within your organisation, within the team? Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a challenge for any team, you know. Like, um, it's, it's easier to be the underdog probably because the expectation isn't high. So when expectation is on you, it poses a new challenge. But that's where the leadership group have been really good. Um, we, we understand, um, we talk about a lot as a team as we're only one loss away from you know, from you know, copping a lot of flack again and we don't want to go back there. We're really happy, you know, working hard for each other and playing good rugby. We want to make our region proud, so that's our driver and, and we just keep focusing on that. You mentioned leadership there and that's where we're going to go back to Glenn Jackson to talk about your captain, your skipper, Patrick Tupolotu, and what he's managed to achieve already in this Super Rugby season, Glenn. Thanks, Goldie. You're right. Last week we talked about um, Sam Nock and how well he did for the Blues over in South Africa. He had another great game, but this week we're going to talk about the big fella in the middle who's the captain. If we look quickly at his minutes played, he's played a lot of minutes for a, for a big guy, and as Leon said, the fitness really showed out. He's playing about 73 minutes per game. One of the things he's doing really, really well at the moment is his core roles, and that's mostly at his lineouts. And you see here against a Hurricanes team, two the lineouts, two lineouts for the Hurricanes. Paddy's head up, just looking what's going on here. Ends up when the ball gets thrown in. He's up and wins the ball. Great turnover for the Blues. 
What I really want to look at is how well he does at lifting, though. He really owns this line-out time here, and he's looking about where the jumper is. And when you've got a guy who's six foot eight or nine, being able to lift a guy like this, this is where the turnovers really count. This is a Hurricanes line-out that they should have won, and they're on attack. The other thing I want to show is Paddy's carry. This is one of the huge carries of the game. Real tight game right now, but he carries the ball well and truly over the advantage line, taking three or four uh, Hurricane defenders with him to get the Blues right on the front foot. This carry's huge for the Blues right here. And then they come up from another play, from the same play now. Patrick Turpolo understands what's going on. He needs to get his team into position. He makes a great decision here just to pick and go. And from here, the Blues score in the corner. Fabulous try from Mark Tillier. But I think the real good work there is from Patrick Tuipalotu. What I think must be really, really exciting for the Blues and for everyone else is his work with the, um, with the referees. In this game, the Blues were down quite uh, after the first two minutes with a try. The penalty count was five to one. You must be really stoked, Leon, how he's been working with the referees because I've, I've been a referee with him and, he, and he's, he's a very good leader, but I just think the way he's talking to the referees and getting them in the game on their side, you must be really pleased with that. Yeah, look, we are. Look, he's a composed guy. He's a, he's a pretty level guy. And I think, um, you know, so that, that suited definitely in the weekend when things were a bit tense. He was the calmer in the group. Um, he spent a lot of time with Tana, who, who was obviously a very good captain in his own right, you know, sitting down, talking about um, those conversations. And, and I think that's helped him a lot. But he's, like I said, he's got good support around him. They, um, the, um, they're helping the leadership group are working together as a team and, and helping him thrive as a captain. You've, JK, talked about the fact sometimes players need to go through some adversity. And Patrick's done that. I mean, there's been some injury challenges. We've seen that through Sam Kane. Uh, here's a guy who's... I look at him. How do you see him in terms of taking that, div uh, that leadership to another level, maybe even the next level? Yeah, I mean, w I had him when I was coaching the Bears as a young man, and, and we could always see that potential. But I think there is a natural progression sometimes. You do need to um, be happy in your own skin, confident that you have the respect of the players. Some, some young guys that come in who are very good at the game, they still don't feel that they've earned that respect. So it does take a little bit of time, and I can just see that in, in Paddy's game. He's also getting exposure at the All Black level, you know, he is a competent um, leader now because he's got that confidence in himself. Takes time. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, I actually want to talk to you again, Leon, about, I, I know your relationship with Paddy um, is probably a big one, um, and then with your senior players, and there's so many things that we've talked about, but if I talk about you, what's the hardest part about your job that we don't get to see? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Um, I don't know. I, I love my job. It's a great job. It's, you know, I'm around motivated people that want to be better. So um, we're really fortunate and... and um you know, I've got good coaching staff around me, good support and, and, and a really supportive board. So there's not a lot of negatives about my job. What about the post-match interview after a loss? Yeah, that's Let's tough. be honest, that's, that's the, the worst interview. Oh, we get to see that. Yeah, we get to see that. I can tell that. you about that a bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talking from experience. Mark's I friends, uh, Mark's friends uh, luckily, I was your assistant coach. They never wanted to talk to me. <laughs> uh, let's talk about a big part of your campaign, though, because when it was announced last year that Bowden Barrett was coming to Auckland, he was going to play for the Blues, um, everyone got really excited. But, of course, it's taken time to get where he, need to, he needed to get to, and what, we're a month out now? He's been in at training. What are the conversations you've had with him so far? Oh, look, they're rugby conversations generally. You know, he's, um, he's, he's pretty dedicated to, to being good, you know, so um, he doesn't want to turn up and uh, get it wrong, and he's learning every move. His book's immaculate. He's obviously a very tidy, uh, diligent student at school because every play's written out perfectly, and he's learning them. So um, his professionalism um, around the game, you know, they'll rub off on others, and, and he'll be a great influence. And um, at the moment, he's just um, he's just fitting in nicely. He's not um, he's not coming in and, and trying to dominate. He's just learning his way through and, and earning the respect. Yeah. Well, the Blues obviously have tried out three playmakers. Bowden's back. Let's try out four. What do you reckon? Yeah, I think there's enough room in the back line. You can find room for four playmakers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking not? forward to that sort of game. <laughs> Let's talk about that, though. The yeah. fact that, you know, the, the other first fives have had to take turns and, and Otiri Black has become fit again in the last couple of weeks, shown some really good signs. Um, have you got a competition for that position? Uh, what are the conversations like right now? A month's a long time away, but what are the conversations with Otiri about what he can do for your side going forward? Yeah, look, we we can't waste time talking about it a month's time from now. Oates is, is, is working really hard on his game every week and, and leading our team brilliantly, and he's, he's doing exactly what we need and, and what we want from him. So at the moment, those conversations with Oates is, is carry on doing what you're doing. Um, you know, he's a big part of, of the strategy side of things, so he, he's, he's Paddy's 
game driver, I suppose, which is what you want from your 10. And, and, um, and at the moment, moment, you know, that's all we're really focusing on and bringing Bodie up to, to speed for when his time comes at some point. Leon, we talked about the rules before. You know, you will be watching a whole lot of rugby. If you're in charge of the referees right now, what's the most frustrating thing that you see week in, week out that you would like to see changed around the rules? Uh, yeah, the breakdown's the one that probably gets us the most. And, and it's such a, such a dynamic area. Um, bodies flying in the height. Um, and, you know, we just want fast ball. And, and when it's not fast, it's normally for a reason, you know. So players are getting up and on the wrong side. They're either holding on or they're coming in off their feet. So just being nice and clean around that breakdown. So um, I'm not sure how you fix it because um, on the flip side of that, on defence, we're trying to slow that ball as much down, you know, as down as much as we can. So, um, yeah, like consistency in any rule. We don't really care what the rule is as long as it's the same every week. I think that's a big thing. We just want consistency so we know what we're dealing with and we can practice it. And you talk about that then, you talk about your defence, you mentioned that, what you're trying to achieve, like everybody else. Has that been one of the key drivers, the big shift you've made in terms of the fact that it seems as though you're conceding, I think, four or five less points than you were last year? Tanarumang is involved in that. Where have the progressions been made in that side of the ball? Is it a pure physicality? What is it? Yeah, it's a combination of a lot of things. It's, um, it's, it's um, fitness, you know, like to have a good defensive team, you've got to get on your feet and get, get back in the line. Uh, you can't lie on the ground because, you, you know, you obviously get short in numbers. So I think our fitness levels are, are pretty good at the moment. That's allowing us to, to get set and, and come forward. And I think we've been able to create a lot of pressure with our line speed at times as well. So um, Tunnel works really hard with the boys. He's, he's a very good defensive coach and obviously making some, some good gains in that area. Yeah, well... Uh Bowden Barrett, is he a 15 or is he a 10? Oh, he's jumped on in here. He wanted to get it in. We talked about this. I mean, is this a hard one for you right now or are you not sure? What is it? Um, oh, look, I think he's a 10 who can play 15 brilliantly. Is that a good sit on the fence answer? Um, he can I reckon play, he'd be he's a, a great winner. He's uh, look, a 15 who can play 10 brilliantly. Is <laughs> like, that, is whatever. whatever he's a footballer. He's a genuine footballer. And, um, you know, like, we, we um, obviously, you know... We haven't had that discussion with Bodie, what he prefers, to be honest. We haven't even gone there. So, you know, if the All Blacks say to him, they want him at 15, and he comes to me and says, I'm at 15, then that's a conversation we'd have. But ultimately, we see him as a 10. I, I mean, I agree with you, Leon. I think he's the best 10 in the world, and I want to see him at 10. Is there a possibility that, you know, bringing him back into the fold, it's not easy to come in. I mean, we all settle in. I mean, it's a great option to start him at fullback and then bring him into 10, you know? It's not hard to just throw someone in, no matter how good you are, here's the football team, go and play. I mean, mm. you know, that's the beauty of players like that. They can play other positions. But, but is the whole back line changing? I mean, we've got fullbacks at first five. We've got, what, you know, you, this is as a, great, a back, this is a what do you do segue. nowadays? This is a great segue because I want to ask this question. We've had a couple of questions come through on Rugby Pass, Instagram, and one of them is a, a critical one for me. That selection change you made on the outsides with Joe Marchant going to the wing and Rico Ioane going into the midfield. Uh, the, the process of coming through that, and is this a desire from Rico? How did you come to that? Um, it, was, it was a decision we made as a coaching group. We, um, you know, Rico trained well at centre. Joe's been playing brilliant for us. We know what he can offer at the midfield. Uh, we knew he played wing before he turned up and wanted to have a look at him there. And, and um, obviously the first, first game we played the Stormers and had a great game. So sometimes you want to try combinations out and, and have a look at it and, and um, we sort of knew what we were going to see and we saw it. So pretty happy with that outcome. So much about skill set then. OK, so for you, since you've been at the Blues, the one single biggest thing you think, the, the change that you've tried to make since you've come into that organisation? Um, I just think um, you, try and, you try and install belief through um, hard work, you know. So if you're working really hard, the guys will gain belief and confidence because they know that, you know, that, that they can bank that and, and expect um, a performance in the weekend. So um, I think that's, that's been the, the constant since I've, I've been here as, as we've been driving, working hard from Monday through to Friday to make sure that you get a performance on Saturday. And although we haven't had the performances on Saturday always, um, we know that it, the consistency of our training will get us there in time. Hey, look, uh, just before we go, big big weekend though coming up. You had to make a change in terms of game time, uh, 4 o'clock at Eden Park. How, how against the Lions, how, how excited would you be to see a, a big, big, big fan base come along and watch this, this team go in action? Well, it's an important game for us as a team because I've talked about um, you know, our, our fans and how important it is to our team. And um, We went away and put some good performance on, but more importantly, we really want to do it in front of a home crowd. So to have a big crowd there this weekend to, to support us will be big, and, and I know that will help us um, and motivate us to get out there and put a good performance on. 4 o'clock, the build-up, 4.25, the kick-off. Well, 
Of course, we look back in time and we look back and flash back to the Chiefs' performance in Super Rugby in the past. This is going to be a huge game, isn't it? It just gets better and better. Chiefs have got another chance here. Holler is there, pushing his way out of a couple of tackles, breaking all sorts of tackles now. Here's an opportunity with Randall racing up and the try will go to Ray Harner. Flicks it away to Duggan, straight across to Ray Harner, goes low and did he get it? Somehow they managed to get rid of it and here goes Ray Harner. They won't stop him. Here's the bonus point. A hat-trick tonight for Bruce Ray Harner. Welcome back to The Breakdown. Well, plenty of action across the world, but of course our northern exposure. It's time now to look at the Six Nations and all the action, well, all of the action that actually got played. Despite the coronavirus scares, Fortress Twickenham held strong for England. That's coming. The inside ball to Watson. Watson! They led 33-16, but then a yellow card and then a red against Manu Toilangi for his high hit, threatened to turn the match. Well, North looks like may have even taken a bit of a knock to the head there. It's over him, every cut. He appears to have accepted the decision with good grace. Yeah, look, that's nice to see. Well, I just find it bizarre, because how else are you supposed to tackle him? Like this bit about where your arms are, what a load of rubbish. Wales closed to within three points but ran out of time. England hanging on to secure the triple crown. And time away from the game is what Joe Marler faces for his crotch grab on Wales skipper Alan Wynne Jones. Wow, 138 tests for my country. You know, funny, I react, I get a red card. So, it's tough, isn't it? Hopefully, we'll drug be able to look at it. And a red card ruined France's hopes at Murrayfield, and with that, possibly a shot at the Six Nations title. Contact to the head, it is a red card. Scotland making the most of their extra man with three tries in their 28 to 17 win. Yeah, such a critical weekend for a number of teams, but these two here, it says 33 to 30, but two late tries by Wales certainly made that game a little bit uh, closer. Uh, England, though, are well and truly now in the race for the Six Nations. And then Scotland. This was the big result for me. France go to Edinburgh, to Murrayfield, to get a result, to be in control of the Six Nations. And what do they do? Yep, they have a prop, Mohamed Hoas, I think is named. He punches someone just like they did last year in the Rugby World Cup, and they lose a player, and they lose a critical game, JK. And I think for me, you know, this is absurd. You know the outcome of this, right? You punch someone, you're going to be a red card. This, to me, has derailed what was an outstanding season. Yeah, I mean, that's ridiculous. We don't want that in the game. That's like as many weeks as you want to give them. I mean, that would have cost the French Rugby Union an incredible amount of money. They win that, they're probably going to win it. And that's just a head explosion. But a violent action. You know, Lomax red carded, it's a technical mistake. He had no intent. That is, you're trying to smack someone's head. Like. Yeah, well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how the French team, they're young, they've got no baggage. Here we go. There's their first bit of baggage for a young French team. Well, they talked about learning from the experience uh, this year. Why didn't they learn from last year's experience? The fact that their biggest, every four years, is the Rugby World Cup, an elbow by Sebastian Vahamahina, and a campaign just completely derailed. I mean, for me, is this what makes French rugby so frustrating? Oh, that's exactly the word. Oh, yeah, it's really disappointing for them, because oh, they've been playing oh, so well, and, you know, they put a lot of work in their coaching staff to... It's really tough for the French to select young players, and they, they went out and did it and had such a good Six Nations, and then, you know, something idiotic like that, uh, just, as you said, just puts them in a bad place again. Ah, idiotic. Great word for the red card. <laughs> Manu Tuolangi. Oh, not, not a red card. Not a red card? Not a red card. And Explain not why. idiotic. Explain and I'll explain to you idiotic. why. I'll explain to you why. If you have a look, Manu Tuolangi is actually bending to tackle height to tackle him. Here he goes down, and the player actually falls into it. So I think it's... Reckless, but it's not a red card. Look, he's coming down. He is actually at tackle height. Mm. The player gets tackled, falls into it. It's for me, 
it's a yellow card every day, it's reckless. But it's not a red card because there was no intent and he's actually at the right tackle height. Yeah, I agree. The well, logo you could see on his chest, that's essentially where he was aiming. Definitely under the, the logo line and, and if he'd stayed up, it would have been a perfectly safe tackle. Mitigating factor, he falls over, hits him in the head. It can't be a red card. Yeah, and I'm more amused about Eddie Jones talking about the 16 players because Ben O'Keefe, good Kiwi boy, he is rubbish at rugby. So <laughs> he wouldn't have helped uh, Wales one bit. But, but uh, yeah, I thought it was tough. You know, he's going at a certain height. Uh, there is contact to the head. And, you know, that's exactly what we're trying to get out of the game. So, you know, it's, that's a shame what happened. But Wayne Pivak, though, um, uh, be disappointed with this campaign from Wales, JK. Yeah, tough, tough act to follow. Um, Warren Gatlin's got a statue outside uh, Carter Farms and, the, you know, they say that most coaches that go through Wales can then coach the All Blacks because it's a goldfish bowl. Um, so there'll be a lot of pressure on him. He'll need to finish well. Um, and uh, important for Scotland, right? I mean, uh, great for them, the fact that... Uh, I know you don't really like watching them. What's with that? Yeah, they just they promise so much and then offer so little, you know? And, and again, <laughs> you know, against Italy, they could have... You know, really put a foot down and they only just beat Italy. But this was really good. Again, the red card probably changed things a little bit. But it's really good to see, which always happens sort of four games into it, it's they come out, the real Scotland sort of turns up. So much uncertainty, though, JK. That's why it's, it's a great okay. tournament. I know well, that you well, don't... Not if, not if games don't get played. Yeah, but... I, mean, with, I know that it's unfortunate. With, yeah, with that's what unfortunate. But are facing right now. The reason why the Northern Hemisphere love this competition is because with one game to go, we don't know who's going to win. You know, brain explosion from the French. They could have won it. England, like, it's just intriguing. Sometimes the footy's not too great, but it's just an intriguing, you know, intriguing, great competition. That's a massive weekend of rugby we've got coming up for us. The New Zealand teams that are in action. Look, I'm really looking forward to this. There's a great contest going down in Hamilton. How do you see that? Chiefs and the Hurricanes? Yeah, well, I'd have to go for Chiefs. Chiefs sort of always bar up at home and they have to here. Uh, Hurricanes are coming off a rough loss. Maybe they'll come back with a, a still a couple of issues. Uh, Lomax is gone and he's an anchor to their scrum, so Chiefs probably getting up. Blues Lions early, JK. That's 4, 4.25 at Eden Park for you. Oh, you've got to be there. There's no traffic. Auckland that time <laughs> of afternoon. He's yeah, talked straight about no traffic, Leon. Straight into Eden Park. You actually get free uh, transport here in the greatest city in the world. Um, <laughs> and the boys need the support, so get in, get a hot dog and watch the boys go well. And some Wolves Crusaders. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This is the way, though. Yeah. No, it's your team, the Sun Wolves, isn't it? Bring nice them back time. in. And Bring them back in. <laughs> oh, my team's the Hollanders. We know where they are. They're taking on the Haguaris. That is in Argentina. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for Leon McDonald. What a fantastic show tonight. Great weekend coming up in front of you. And we'll see you next Tuesday night.